Hello, my name is Dr. John Basso from the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm going to speak to you today about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease for the Rhinology Worldwide Video Textbook. My special thanks to Dr. David Gudis, Dr. Jibian Lee, and Dr. David Kennedy for inviting me to do this presentation. Here are my disclosures. Today's learning objectives on AERD or aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease or what was called Sampras triad in the past will be to discuss the definition, clinical presentation, epidemiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment of this condition. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, AERD, is a syndrome of chronic eosinophilic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis and asthma. The disease progresses despite careful avoidance of NSAIDs and aspirin. It is characterized by the hallmark of aspirin and NSAID-induced rhinitis and asthma attacks. This is quite prevalent in ENT and allergy practices. In fact, about 1.5 to 1.7 million patients in the United States are estimated to have it based on previously published statistics and interpolation about 10% of polyp patients, about 15% of severe asthmatics, about 40% of patients who have both adult onset asthma and polyps have AERD. So this is much more common than previously recognized. And it, for that reason, it is likely under-recognized and under-diagnosed. In terms of clinical presentation, typically this is diagnosed in adulthood or at least post-puberty. It's very rare to see a case before puberty. Most patients have refractory rhinitis, which occurs first. It then develops into chronic eosinophilic rhinosinusitis, loss of smell, and nasal polyps. Often patients undergo multiple sinus surgeries and or polypectomies. As the rhinosinusitis becomes more severe, most patients develop asthma. And the asthma can sometimes precede the polyps, or at least the perception of asthma or the perception of polyps on the basis of either diagnosis or patient recognition. Within this time frame, or even later, patients become NSAID sensitive. So it occurs not all at the same time. So it's possible to, to catch a patient while the triad is evolving. Asthma and nasal symptoms continue despite avoidance of NSAIDs. So taking NSAIDs uh, does not cause this condition. Rarely the patient may develop NSAID sensitivity prior to any of the other triad components. Other features of the disease can, uh, are rapid recurrence of nasal polyps. These patients have polyps that come back very quickly after surgery. They often have peripheral blood and nasal polyp tissue eosinophilia very high levels of, of tissue eosinophilia and moderately high levels of peripheral blood eosinophilia. And respiratory reactions often occur with alcohol consumption more frequently than they do with other types of polyp patients, not exclusively, but much more frequently. Up to 80% of patients with AERD will report an upper or lower respiratory tract infection, uh, uh, upper or lower respiratory tract uh, symptom occurring uh, with the ingestion of alcohol, primarily uh, with red wine and, uh, and beer, but also with spirits. The natural history is that almost all patients have pan-sinusitis by the time they're diagnosed. A normal CT scan essentially rules out AERD, and women seem to outnumber men by about 57 to 43%. It is quite a severe sinus disease. As I mentioned, it's quite aggressive. Patients tend to have very poor sense of smell. They tend to have many sinus surgeries. Otologic and intracranial polyps have been uh, reported. And so this, again, is a very aggressive sinus disease endotype. It also has a very unique pathobiology in that patients have mast cell activation, combined with eosinophil infiltration, overproduction and upregulation of leukotrienes at baseline and during NSAID reactions, activation of the innate type 2 lymphoid cell, the ILC2 cell, 
and these very unique platelet neutrophil aggregates, all playing a role in the development of this condition. As you can see in this diagram, the breakdown of the epithelium, whether it be from a viral infection, a smoke inhalation, toxins, allergens, the breakdown of the epithelium starts the inflammatory process, first through the release of epithelial interleukins, IL-3325 and TSLP, which then stimulate the ILC2 cell, which is a gap bridger between the innate and, and the uh, adaptive immune system. What happens here is that you have an upregulation of leukotrienes, you have the production of type two uh, cytokines, interleukin five, four, and 13. Mast cells and eosinophils tend to feed each other with inflammatory um, stink signals. Leukotrienes that are released further feed forward on the epithelium through solitary chemosensory cells, then stimulating the mast cell to release multiple mediators, as well as stimulating the thromboxane receptor and other receptors on inflammatory cells. Histamine and tryptase are released as well. In addition, there is this platelet neutrophil aggregate that is a machine for the production of high amounts of leukotrienes, which then have effects on smooth muscle, mucus release, and the vascular endothelium, as well as bronchoconstriction. One way to look at this is that there is an excess of pro-inflammatory molecules and an underrepresentation of anti-inflammatory molecules and an icosanoid imbalance. What about NSAID reactions in AERD? All COX-1 inhibiting NSAIDs will cross-react with each other in AERD, the standard classical ones. However, the highly selective COX-2 inhibitors, such as celecoxib in the United States and non-acetylated salicylates are typically tolerated in patients with AERD. Now acetaminophen and the less selective COX-2 inhibitors are generally well tolerated until you get into higher doses. So at lower doses, they're tolerated, uh, but at higher doses, there will be a subset of patients, approximately one third of them who will uh, have reactions that are less severe, but only at the higher doses. You can see we've broken down the uh, COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors on this table, the highly selective COX-1 inhibitors <clears throat> up top, and there's total cross-reactivity and, and all patients will react here. <clears throat> In the next group, you see the weakly selective COX-1 inhibitors, primarily acetaminophen. And here only at high dose will you get a small subset of patients who will react. Highly selective COX-2 inhibitors are, uh, patient, are safe for patients to take. Patients will not have reactions to these. And then there are drugs like meloxicam that will inhibit COX-2 and COX-1, but COX-1 only at higher doses. So they may be safe at lower doses. What occurs in aspirin and NSAID reactions? Well, arachidonic acid, as you know, can go down the prostaglandin or the leukotriene pathway. At baseline, patients who have AERD will have upregulated leukotriene pathway. They will have a down-regulated prostaglandin E2, which allows for that upregulated leukotriene pathway. There's less of the prostaglandin E receptor and less COX-2. When patients take a COX-1 inhibitor, they further uh, inhibit this pathway, reducing prostaglandin E2 to a much lower level, further reducing the stimulation of the receptor and upregulating even further this very, very large amount of leukotriene production. What are some of the hints, the clinical hints that you may find on imaging? Well, the higher the lund mckay score, Masha showed that the higher the lund mckay score, the higher the likelihood that the patient would have AERD. 
when he first saw that AERD patients had a much higher lund mckay score than patients with aspirin-tolerated as, uh, aspirin asthma. Other radiographic pearls for the diagnosis of AERD include the opacification seems to be greatest in the frontal and ethmoid sinuses and least in the maxillaries in early stages. If a patient has complete sinus surgery and no medical therapy, you will see uh, regrowth in the frontal ethmoid area first. In advanced disease, you often see thickening and neoosteogenesis, particularly of the sphenoid sinus septum. And here you see the radiographic pro progression in AERD, the early findings of primarily ethmoid and frontal disease and the late findings of pan-sinusitis. In advanced AERD, you see uh, on the right, you will see uh, patients who have this thickening of the intersinus septum between the, the left and right sphenoid sinus. Pathologically, these patients have the highest eosinophil density in tissue and surgical tissue. So this was a study of uh, different endotypes of eosinophilic sinusitis. And you can see that the AERD patients had higher amounts of eosinophil density than patients with allergic fungal sinusitis and patients with eosinophilic polyps. The diagnosis of AERD is a clinical diagnosis in most cases. Patients will present with polyps, asthma, and respiratory reactions to NSAIDs. This is important to garnish this information from the history. It's important to find out what types of reactions and how many. If a patient has a history of two reactions to NSAIDs within three hours, they have about a 90% chance of having AERD, a positive predictive value of 89%. If there is one serious respiratory reaction that resulted in an emergency room visit or a hospitalization, that gives 100% positive predictive value. This is important to know as to when you're going to consider a challenge. If a patient has only one reaction, it's about 80%. So there is no in vitro test that tells you the patient has AERD. There are some that may be suggestive, but none of them really have cutoffs that are definitive for AERD. So the gold standard has always been the positive aspirin challenge. This has to be properly done. Patients need to withhold medications that can block reactions such as leukotriene modifiers, antihistamines, and, and oral corticosteroids. Whenever there's doubt about the history of the patient does not ingest NSAIDs, there, so a lot of patients don't take NSAIDs, and so they may not know they have a, that does not rule out AERD. Or if a patient is taking a leukotriene modifier, their reaction may be muted and they may not realize that they react to NSAIDs. And tolerance to 81 milligrams of aspirin does not preclude the diagnosis because patients can sometimes have their threshold reaction at a higher dose. What about the treatment of AERD? Treatment involves avoiding aspirin and NSAIDs to completely eliminate or protect patients from having serious life-threatening respiratory reactions. But it does not prevent AERD from starting, continuing, and progressing. So one must treat the underlying respiratory disease. And the best strategy is to involve a multidisciplinary team, both surgeons and non-surgeons, rhinologists and allergists. Currently, the evidence-based treatment of AERD includes complete endoscopic sinus surgery, and not just a polypectomy, corticosteroids, both systemic and topical, leukotriene modifiers, both 5-LO inhibitors and cis-LT1 receptor blockers, aspirin therapy after aspirin desensitization, or what we'll call ATAD, and T2 biologics are emerging as a additional therapy for patients with AERD. What are the goals of surgery? One of the main goals is to improve the deposition of topical steroids because we want to have topical steroids reach deep into the sinuses. By eliminating these bony lamella, these bony partitions, the surgeon 
will allow for reduced inflammatory surface area, area where polyps can grow. So not only are we reducing the area where polyps can grow, but we're also allowing for better deposition of topical steroids. Think of uh, treating asthma without being able to get inhaled corticosteroids to the lungs, to, to the peripheral airways. As you can see, there are different types of post-surgical cavities. And, and what we want to achieve is what's shown on the left. You want to have all the bony partitions removed. You want to have wide entrostomies and you want to be able to have topical therapy be able to reach the key areas of the frontal recess and the superior ethmoid area and the, uh, and the olfactory groove. One way to accomplish this is with sinus irrigation. We're frequently using budesonide and high dose mometasone uh, and there are numer numerous studies showing that these can be used safely and topically using an irrigation strategy. The irrigation not only reduces mucus and debris and other pro-inflammatory molecules, but retrograde flow, as you can see here in the video to the right, uh, retrograde flow is key to get good penetration into the sinuses. So again, sinus surgery will improve the delivery of topical medications into the sinuses. Thank you, Dr. Richard Harvey for that video. Another strategy for improving deposition of topical steroids into the sinuses is this enhanced delivery system of fluticasone. It provides a broader deposition pattern and it does so by having a mouthpiece and a nasal stenting nasal piece. Patients will, uh, will press the bottle and blow into the mouthpiece at the same time. By doing so, the soft palate will close. This increases the pressure in the nasal cavity. You can see here the deposition in the central panel, deposition of typical aqueous nasal sprays. However, in the far right panel, you can see that the enhanced delivery system with exhalation reaches superiorly and posteriorly into the nasal cavity with much better a deposition. What about leukotriene modifiers? Montelukast has been shown primarily to improve lower airway function. And it reduces asthma exacerbations, improved quality of life, and improves lung function in patients with AERD. But Xylutan, which blocks the 5-LO pathway, seems to have a more effective, uh, effective ability to reduce leukotrienes in this condition. It not only seems to improve all of the parameters that Montelukast does, but it also seems to have an effect on upper airway symptoms such as rhinorrhea and nasal congestion. There are a number of studies that support this, and they, again, focus not only on the FEV1 improvement, but also on the, on, on the subjective symptoms of smell and, uh, and rhinorrhea. What about aspirin, aspirin desensitization? Who would think that aspirin, the, 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 the medication which makes this condition worse, would potentially make this problem better? This is often used post-surgically to maintain the post-surgical cavity. Aspirin desensitization after aspirin, uh, aspirin therapy after aspirin desensitization is what it is the therapeutic mod modality. This is usually accomplished in one to three days, depending on the protocol. Indications for aspirin therapy after desensitization include persistent sinonasal and asthma symptoms in a patient with AERD despite conventional medical and surgical therapy. Contraindications include pregnancy, history of ulcer disease, history of a bleeding disorder, and eosinophilic esophagitis. Relative contraindications, which are rem remediable, include poorly controlled asthma, so patients' asthma must be controlled before you can consider aspirin desensitization. And if a patient has significant nasal polyp burden at the time of desensitization, one would recommend that, the, that a surgery would be performed to eliminate the nasal polyp burden prior to uh, undergoing aspirin desensitization 
followed by aspirin therapy. There are numerous studies, at least 18 positive studies showing the efficacy of aspirin therapy after desensitization. Four of these have been double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Almost all of them show the same thing, a reduction in revision surgery, prednisone, and antibiotic use, as well as asthma exacerbations and improved sense of smell, as well as endoscopy scores. Aspirin desensitization is what I'd like to call a multi-mediator blocker in this, in this day and age of uh, monoclonal antibodies against specific mediators. Remember that aspirin desensitization has been shown to reduce or inhibit many mediators, key ones like cis-LT1 receptors, leukotriene E4 secretion, prostaglandin D2 secretion, leukotriene B4 production, IL-4, and most recently, although not yet published, our, our lab has shown that interleukin-33 is reduced and, uh, and gamma interferon is elevated. All that in one pill. We also showed that daily overall corticosteroid use is dramatically decreased by about 70% in patients who have aspirin desensitization once you get past six to 12 months. Inhaled corticosteroid use also reduces. Patients start shifting from more high dose therapy towards lower dose therapy, which is statistic again at the four to six month mark. This seems to be the point at which uh, aspirin desensitization starts having an effect. So we don't see any statistically significant changes until about four to six months in almost all parameters we studied. Here we took a cohort of patients that came in with a, lung, uh, with a um, SNOT22 score of approximately 50. And then postoperatively, and postoperatively patients receive uh, corticosteroids orally, that one month mark is when they were at, at their absolute best. After corticosteroids were weaned, aspirin desensitization, for the most part, maintained uh, that SNOT22 score over 30 month follow up in this study. We also showed that the comparison of using me as the allergist and before I came to University of Pennsylvania and after I came to University of Pennsylvania to start the Penn AERD Center, our outcomes were good before, but they significantly improved once we formed a single center, a multidisciplinary center. So when I was in New York and I was getting referrals from the Penn rhinologists, we were doing reasonably well and patients were maintaining their, uh, their improvements up to, up to two years out after uh, desensitization. When I joined and we looked at the cohort in the multidisciplinary study, you could see that there's even a more dramatic improvement in the Lund Mackay, I'm sorry, in the SNOT22 scores uh, for patients over time. We also showed that there was better adherence in our single center versus the multi-center. There were less patients who were lost to follow-up. The revision surgery rate, although it was extremely low at about 5%, has essentially gone down to zero. Now, most recently, we, we looked at and confirmed a clinical suspicion that I've had for many years. And it seems like our women who are desensitized do reasonably well. They seem to hold their post-op status for a long time. And that's borne out here. But what I've always noticed is that males seem to have an even more robust dramatic improvement. They seem to be super responders to, to aspirin therapy, something that we should keep in mind in the future and is borne out here by this data, which starts becoming significant again at four to six months. And when we look, this first slide was looking at the SNOT22, 
which of course we want to reduce over time. And the asthma control test, again, was reasonably maintained postoperatively and prior to desensitization. That's, that's what we want to maintain. That's the level at which patients are, are at their best. And although it was maintained reasonably well in women, there seemed to be a further improvement in the male cohort, something which we just recently published last month in IFAR. Oftentimes we are asked, what dose of aspirin do patients need to maintain an anti-inflammatory effect in this disease? And so we looked at a large number of patients who were on various maintenance doses. And what we saw is that the group in the greater than 60 year old cohort required less aspirin. The equivalent approximately two aspirin per day or 325 milligrams twice a day was the average dose for the over 60 group. And the under 60 group, we're, we were closer to three aspirin per day on the average. We're also going to be looking at breaking this down even further with, with the larger cohort. It looks like after the age of 70, that number even goes down further. What are the complications of aspirin therapy? Everyone worries about how many patients will tolerate this? Well, it turns out, like most therapies, about 85% of patients will tolerate and not discontinue this therapy. But for the other 15%, a most common complication that led to discontinuation was gastritis, as one would predict. Exacerbation of lower airway symptoms was next. But we only had about less than 1% in terms of a GI bleed and less than 1% in terms of anaphylaxis, which occurred after desensitization. So those are the most serious adverse effects and seem to be very infrequent. And, uh, and so overall, the safety of aspirin therapy, particularly when patients are communicating with you about uh, their symptoms early on, uh, seem, to be, uh, seem, to be very, uh, seem to be very good. I list here 10 important reasons for aspirin desensitization. Uh, to borrow a David Letterman type uh, countdown. Number 10 is it slows down the regrowth of new polyps. Number nine, it reduces the need for oral corticosteroids. Number eight, it reduces the number of sinus infections. And I will add to number nine, also inhaled corticosteroids. Number seven, it reduces the number of sinus surgeries. Number six, it improves the quality of life via the SNOT-22. And also we did an SF-12 study that also showed the same thing, including sleep. And number five, it improves sense of smell and nasal congestion. Four, it allows the ability to take full dose NSAIDs. Remember when you are desensitized to aspirin, you are cross desensitized to all COX-1 NSAIDs. It also allows for cardio vascular thromboembolic prophylaxis. And aspirin is very cheap. And so is the procedure, relatively speaking, compared to some of the newer therapies. Of course, the most important reason for aspirin desensitization is something that we published in 2017. And that is that there is an improved alcohol tolerance amongst patients with AERD who are desensitized to aspirin. <laughs> Let's talk about the T2 biologics. Dupilumab in the sinus 24 and the sinus 52 study showed significant results in multiple parameters, allowing it to get FDA approval for nasal polyps. When they parsed out the AERD group based on history, they were able to show that for the nasal polyp score, and it's not 22, sense of smell score, lung Mackay score, the UPSIT score, and the total SNOT-22 score, the AERD patients seem to do just as well as the non-AERD patients. They also had improved nasal congestion as well. So although this was an extrapolation study, the data are, are very statistically significant. Omalizumab, there's one study that was non-randomized, non-controlled of 21 patients who had challenge-proven AERD. One would expect that since omalizumab has significant effect on mast cell and basophil activation, that it would help AERD. 
So it's logical to expect some benefit. And in the Hayashi study, what we saw was that there was a reduction of leukotriene E4 as well as prostaglandin D2 with omalizumab. In addition, most patients were excellent or good responders in terms of asthma exacerbations and sinus symptoms. What about mepolizumab, anti-IL-5? So there was one small retrospective analysis of 14 AERD patients. They compared before and three months after mepolizumab was, uh, was used. Patients were on at least three months of mepolizumab before they analyzed the retrospectively the data. And they showed that there was a significant improvement in the absolute eosinophil count as one would expect, but more importantly, a reduction in the SNOT22 score a reduction in the smell taste questionnaire for SNOT22, improvement in SNOT and nasal congestion, improvement in the asthma control test. No significant improvement in FEV1 was noted. However, with the enthusiasm we have on, for T2 biologics, their exorbitant co costs, as you can see here, often relegate them to salvage therapy. As you can see that sinus surgery and aspirin desensitization and topical steroid rinses, as well as aspirin are much cheaper. Most of the algorithms that have been shown in the literature uh, and certainly at our Penn AERD center, we will use T2 biologics in patients who have either uh, failed aspirin desensitization or are not good candidates for aspirin desensitization or who are not good candidates for surgery. So what does the future hold for the treatment of AERD? Well, there are more mediator blockers as one would expect, but considering that this is a multi-mediator process, uh, I think that although these may be helpful to use in combination, you know, not considering the cost involved, I do believe that until we have gene therapy or epithelial repair, that we're really not going to get the treatment or the cure for AERD that we are looking for. But things are much better than they were. And I can think of my career over the course of my career, uh, I have seen great strides made in the treatment of AERD. And I expect that over the next 10 to 20 years, we'll see even more improvement uh, and potentially a cure. So to summarize some of the key points of this lecture, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease is under-recognized and therefore underdiagnosed. It's an aggressive form of sinus disease that likely results from a dysfunctional inflammatory immune response and involves numerous cells and numerous cytokines. AERD diagnosis may require an aspirin challenge, especially when the clinical history is not clear cut. Therapy often includes complete sinus surgery, aspirin therapy after desensitization, topical corticosteroids, leukotriene modifiers, and occasionally type two biologics. Multidisciplinated integrated care is ideal in order to achieve prolonged excellent outcomes. This is important because the ability to communicate and, and coordinate between specialists is key to patients doing well. Here are some suggested readings for, for the comprehensive, uh, comprehensive review. This, there's, a, there's a reading here uh, on the working group from, for the American Academy of Allergy and Asthma and Immunology that looked at aspirin desensitization in great detail, protocols, indications, contraindications, uh, special situations. We talked about the multidisciplinary study. There is a review in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that is reasonably up to date, does not speak too much about type two biologics, but it's from 2018 and I urge you to read that 
I have a, uh, a, a, a um, editorial that I wrote recently for IFAR discussing the, where I believe biologics fit in with Ashman desensitization. And there also is a recent publication of a multidisciplinary consensus on a stepwise algorithm for treating all polyps. And this is a shout out to my Penn AERD team. They are what really makes the results so good. Thank you very much for your attention.